All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Joshua Ott. I work in the Stanford Intelligence Systems Lab, and my research is largely focused on autonomous exploration. So as you can imagine, a large part of that involves decision-making under uncertainty, specifically reasoning about how we plan out a series of actions into the future and quantifying and sort of thinking about how the uncertainty will propagate through those actions. And so very closely related to that is what we're going to be talking about today, which is policy optimization. So with policy optimization, where we're sort of going to start is looking at this parameterized policy that we set up and then looking at just sort of local changes that we can make to it. So that's sort of the policy search section. Then we're going to transition to talking about how can we estimate the gradient with respect to that policy. And we're going to use that gradient estimate to then help us optimize our policy. Okay, so that's sort of the, the layout, the scope for policy optimization. But I think before diving in to any of that, it's helpful to sort of zoom all the way out, look at the big picture, orient ourselves of where we are, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. Okay, so we have this sort of model that we're working with here, where we have an agent acting in some environment, and the agent can take an action and receive some observation. Okay, so this is very general, right? The agent could be a rover on the surface of another planet, or it could be a financial trading agent that's making buy and sell decisions, right? It's very, very general. So maybe if we go one to two levels down now, we have this idea of the, the Markov decision process, right? Which is saying essentially the same thing as the picture on the left, just with a little more structure. So we have some agent in a state. That agent can take actions, and based on the action that it takes in that state, it receives some reward and then transitions to a new state. Okay, so this idea of receiving rewards in a particular state sort of brings out the idea of the utility function, which is telling us what's the utility or value for being in a particular state. Okay, and then linked to that, we have this idea of the policy, and that's what we're talking about today. So the policy is like our, our strategy, right? It's how we, how we take actions. It's telling us how we, what action we should take in a particular state. Okay, so that's the sort of big picture we should keep in mind as we're going through this, right? That's how all of these pieces fit together, and now we're going to dive into the details of it. Okay, so we're starting with policy search, and policy search is really focused on just searching the space of policies. Okay, so it's exactly what's in the title, right? So how we're going to start here is by parameterizing our policy. Okay, so we're going to represent our policy with some some vector of parameters here that we're going to call our thetas. Okay, so we have n different parameters that we're calling theta1 to theta n. Okay, so these parameters right now could be anything, really. They're whatever we want. We're not saying how we're parameterizing our policy. We're just saying that we have these parameters. Okay, so our policy could be parameterized by some neural network, right? And these would be the weights and biases of our neural network, but it doesn't have to be. It can be some other general function. Question. How does it differ, or how does it fit into the world of like what we learned about like, like lectures ago, like policy or uh, like policy iteration, value iteration? That's a great question. That's exactly where we're going to next. So okay. we're gonna yeah, we'll we'll dive into that. Oh, the, the question was how does policy search relate to what we've seen in the past with like value iteration or policy iteration? So we'll see that right now. <laughs> so we have these this set of parameters here. And we can say our policy now is just this pi theta. So our policy just parameterized by these, this set of parameters. Okay. So now going to your question, what we've seen in the past is that we can we know we can say what the utility when following a particular policy is. Right. So we've seen that we can say the utility when following a policy from some state s is equal to the immediate re reward that we receive. Right plus the action for, for the action that our policy tells us to take in that state. And then we have the discounted future reward here. So sum over all the next states that we could then transition to when following that policy. Okay, and then we also have the U of S prime that's cut off here. So that's in there. Okay, so that's, that's telling us the utility when following a particular policy. Okay, but that's only from a certain state. So what we want to sort of get an idea of now is the utility of our policy in general, right? Not just from one state, but from every possible state that we could be in, 
Okay, so what that looks like is when we say the utility of a policy, we're talking about, so this is utility of a policy parameterized by theta. What we'll do is we're going to equivalently just write this as u of theta. Okay, so this is just sort of shorthand notation here to sort of drop the, the pi theta because really what controls our policy is these parameters. Okay, so these mean the same thing here. It's just sort of convention. All right. So what we're saying now is we want the utility of our policy in general, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at over every possible state that we could be in, the probability that we're in that state, then times the utility when following our policy from that state, okay? So that's what we mean when we're talking about this general idea of the utility of a, a particular policy, okay? So using the same concept that we've seen in the past and now applying it to looking at every possible state that we could be in. This is the probability that we're in that state. Okay, so in practice though, this is pretty hard to compute, right? If, our, if we have a very large state space or our state space is continuous, it's almost impossible, right, to get this actual quantitative value. Okay, so that's, that's what we wanna talk about now is how can we actually approximate this utility of a policy, right? Because in practice, when we're working with large scale problems, it's not, not feasible to directly compute this. Question. Uh, when you say B of S, uh, the previous one, like T, the transition probabilities make sense, but how do you calculate the general probability for what the probability of is? Yeah, good question. So this would be either you have some, some prior knowledge of what the, uh, what the uh, probability would be of starting in that particular state. You, may, you might have some data set, in which case you could sort of back out a probability from that data. But some, some domain knowledge that you have here would sort of give you this, this prior knowledge of what the probability of being in that state is. And sorry, the, the question was, uh, how do we know this, this B of S here? Okay, so we want to come up with a way that we can get some approximation for this utility, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about now, and I think it helps to sort of start with this visual example here. So... For this example, consider that you're a rover on the surface of Mars, okay? And let's say that we're pretty sure our rover is starting somewhere in this ellipse region. We're not exactly sure where, but we have some initial belief about where we think the rover is here. So what we're going to do to estimate this utility here is we're going to simulate policy rollouts, okay? And that's what we're going to visualize here. So to simulate a policy rollout, what we do, we have this initial belief distribution, we're going to sample an initial state from that. So this distribution could be a Gaussian distribution, could be a uniform distribution, doesn't matter right now. We're just saying we have some distribution that we're starting with. We sample an initial state from that distribution, and then we're going to give that state to our policy. So we say, hey, policy, I'm in this state right now. What should I do? The policy says, you should go one meter forward. So you go one meter forward, and then now you ask your policy again, what should I do now? Turn one meter to the right. So you turn one meter to the right, and then you ask your policy again. Now it says go one meter forward. And you just continue to do that, and you roll out your policy into the future. Okay? So that's a policy rollout. So we do that. We roll out our policy to some depth that we specify, and we get a trajectory now. So that's one policy rollout that we've done. We can repeat this process, right? We can repeat it as many times as we want. So we sample a new state now, and then we roll out our policy into the future. Okay, and we can just continue repeating this. In our case, we'll do this three times here. So now we have three trajectories that we've rolled out into the future. With each of these, right, we have some reward model that we can then sort of query, right? For each of these trajectories that we roll out, we get some associated reward. So this top one probably is not so good, right? Because it drives us over the rocks there. That's going to be a very bumpy ride for our rover. So we don't like that. The middle one does a little bit better, but still gets us sort of close to the rock, so not great. And then this bottom one, we'd say, okay, that's, that's pretty good, steers us clear there, okay? So we have that approximation now that we've done just with these, by simulating these policy rollouts into the future. So now we're gonna use that to come back to how do we estimate this utility of our policy, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we've collected these trajectory rollouts that we've simulated, okay? So now we can say utility of our policy is just the expected reward that we think we'll receive 
along those trajectories. Okay, so this is just an expectation over the rewards that we got, right? The red, yellow, and green trajectories. Those were the rewards that we received. So we're taking the expectation over that. So from the definition of just expectations, we can write this out in an integral form where we have the probability of that trajectory occurring when following our particular policy, okay? And then just from definition of expectation, it's just times the reward, right? Expectation is probability of this, this term times the term, right? And then we just integrate that. That's the expectation. Okay, so again, yes, question? Yeah, so the question was, are there cases where we care about how variable the re reward might be? So that's an excellent question, and that's a very big part of policy optimization in general, is that the variance of the rewards from your policy rollouts tends to be quite high. So dealing with that variance is a big challenge, and that's something we're going to get to later. So that's a great question. Okay, so we, we have this expectation here, and sort of similar to what we have before, right? We're, we're not actually going to compute this integral. Maybe in, in certain cases where we have a simple, uh, simple policy setup, we could do this, but in the general sense, we're going to approximate this with Monte Carlo samples, okay? So we, we know we've already sampled our, uh, our different policy trajectories here, and to approximate this integral, we're going to say that this is approximately equal to just the average reward that we receive along our trajectories, where this is, this is the ith trajectory. So we go from i equals 1 to m. OK, so in, in that example that we saw, we, we did three policy rollouts, right? So we had three trajectories. So n was 3 here, and then we're just averaging the reward, right? So the average between red, yellow, and green, that would give us somewhere in the yellow, right? So it's just an OK policy. It's not great. Yes? So when you say the reward, do you mean the instantaneous reward and just like one point? Or do you mean like the whole uh, like Bellman equation into the future added up thing? Yeah, good question. This is the discounted, the total discounted reward we receive along that trajectory. Yep. The question was, when we, when we say reward here, are we talking about the immediate reward or the, uh, the discounted reward into the future? So this is the discounted reward that we receive along the whole trajectory. OK, so that's how we use this idea of policy rollouts. Why, why are we doing this? Right? What, what's the point of the policy rollouts? We wanted to get this, this concept of the utility of a particular policy. This allows us to say, is a policy good or not, right? It's sort of giving us some quantitative way to say, is our policy doing well, okay? We saw that we would have to look at every, every possible state, right? So instead of doing that, we're just saying, from our current state, let's simulate trajectories out into the future and then look at the average reward that we're getting and that gives us this estimate for how good is our policy right now, okay? So that's, that's the whole picture of what we've looked at so far. Now we're gonna use this idea for policy search, okay? So this was just sort of the setup of how we sort of quantify is a policy good or not. So what we're gonna start with is local search, okay? So what we're showing here in this picture, you have theta two on the y-axis, theta one is on the x-axis. So this is just a very simple policy, okay? It's just a two, we have two parameters in this policy, theta one and theta two, very simple, okay? And what we're showing in the color scheme there is the utility of, of those parameters, which we don't, we don't know that to start with, right? So we don't, we don't know any of that. That's sort of hidden to us, but for the visualization, we're seeing it in the background. Okay, so what we do is we start with our current parameters. So our current set of theta one and theta two puts us right here, okay? Then what we do in local search is we just simply take a sort of plus step and a minus step along each parameter direction. Okay, so because we have two parameters here, that would lead us to taking 2n, so 2 times n, where n is the number of parameters, that's the number of candidate points we're going to evaluate. Okay, so here we have two parameters, 2 times 2 is 4, so we're looking at four candidate parameters, and that's what you're, you're seeing here. So this was a plus step in the theta 2 direction, minus step in the theta 2 direction, I'm skipping ahead there. <laughs> 
Uh, this is a plus step in the theta one, minus step in the theta one. Okay, so we're looking at those four uh, candidate points. Now, at each of these candidate points, we have a new set of parameters here, right? So with this new set, we then do some M set of policy rollouts into the future, okay? And that gives us an estimate for our utility at each of those uh, parameter sets, okay? So when we do that, we see, well, which one is the best performer, okay? It will be this point, assuming we do a large number of rollouts to get a, a reasonable estimate. So what we then do is we move our parameters to that, that candidate point. So we move over there, because we said that's the best performer. And now we just repeat this process. So we again do our 2n, we evaluate our 2n candidate points. We do m sets of trajectory rollouts for each of those candidate points we're looking at. We get some estimate of the utility for that particular policy. And then we step to the direction of the best one. So here, the best one will be this one. And I should mention the, the dark blue color here, that's the, the higher utility. The green and yellow is the lower utility, okay? So we step to that bottom point now, and then we just repeat again. So we look, which one of these four candidate points has the highest utility? Well, it's the lowest one. So we're gonna step to the lowest one. Again, we, we repeat this process. Again, it's that lowest point there, so we move down there. But now notice, when we're here, the best performing point is this one, okay? And it might be hard to see that color gradient, but it is this point here. So none of the candidate points we're evaluating are better than the, the point that we're currently at. So what do we do now? Well, we're gonna shrink now. We shrink our step size. So we bring our step size in, and now we're not stepping as far in each candidate direction. Okay, so now we evaluate. Does anyone improve? No, so we're gonna shrink again. And we just continue shrinking down until we get a better candidate point. So in this case, we've shrunk down, and now actually the one on the right is the better performer. And so we step there. And you just repeat this process over and over until you reach some threshold where your step size has dropped between, and we call that our convergence point. Okay, so that's, that's our local search method. So is there always just one parameter being updated, or are there cases where there's multiple are updated at the same time? Right, yes, good question. So yeah, you, you, because we're stepping in sort of that plus or minus for each of our candidate parameters, right, we'll end up taking just the, the one candidate point that was the best performer. So it was only going to be that changing one of those parameters. Yep. Are you showing the utility or the loss? The, in the diagram, we're showing the utility. So the blue is the, is the higher. Uh, yeah, the better value. Okay, so some of the issues with this, right? This kind of seems like it's reasonable, right? But this was a case where we only had two parameters. So if we have, you know, billions of parameters, this is going to be not very feasible, right? Because for each of these candidate points, we have to do a set, a new set of M rollouts. So that's just going to take forever if our parameter set is very large, okay? And then the other sort of factor here is that we have, to, we have to set the step size, right, to begin with. We have to choose that initial step size. So that could be a tuning parameter due to, you know, whatever you think your utility space looks like. So those are sort of some of the drawbacks of this local search method. So the next method that we're going to talk about is the cross entropy method. And this is very similar idea to local search, but goes about it in slightly different way. Okay, so what we're working with here now with the cross entropy method is a search distribution. Okay, so before we were just taking those fixed step size, now we're introducing this idea of a search distribution. And our search distribution we write as p theta of psi. Okay, so psi here is our search distribution parameters. So don't get confused here because theta is our, our policy parameters, and psi are our search distribution parameters. Okay, so what do we mean by that? A common choice for our search distribution would just be a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so if we're using a Gaussian distribution, all psi is is just the mean and covariance of our Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's what psi is. We still, what we really care about, right, is our, our theta parameters. That's what we're trying to change here. Our search distribution is just now sort of how we're gonna be moving around the policy space. Okay, so we have this search distribution, 
We have our search distribution parameters. For now, let's say we're working with a Gaussian distribution, okay? So I think it, it helps to see this visually to sort of understand what's going on. So with our, our search distribution here, what we're showing, the, these white contour lines, that's our search distribution, okay? So that's our Gaussian distribution that we're showing with the contour lines there. What we're going to do now is, so for now, ignore these, uh, the red points. Just treat them as if they were all white points, okay? So what we do, how, cro how the cross-entropy method works is we start by taking m samples of theta from this search distribution, okay? So from this initial distribution that we have shown by these contour lines, we take m samples. So those are all these white and red points. Treat them as if they were all white right now. Okay, so we take those M samples. Those give us our candidate points. So those are our starting candidate points that we want to evaluate. Very similar to local search, right? We now, for each of those candidate points, we do our M set of policy rollouts to get some estimate of the utility for each of those points. And then what we're going to do, we're going to look at, okay, which of those candidate points are our best performers? We call these our elite samples. So we specify some, some number of elite samples. We can say, let's take the top five performing uh, samples from our, from our candidates here. Okay, and those become, those are these red points here that you're seeing. Those are our, our elite samples. So we take our elite samples, and now we just refit our search distribution. So we refit our search distribution to these elite performers. And then we just repeat this process. Okay, so what does that look like if we go through it? Well, we have, we have those elite samples there, so now we're just going to refit our distribution to it. So we get that new distribution shown there, and then we just repeat this process. Okay, so from our new distribution that we're showing here, we sample a new set of endpoints. That's what we're showing. And then we evaluate which ones are the elite samples. So what are our best performing points? Those are the red points. And then we refit to those red points. Then we repeat this process again. Where's our best performing points? Well, they're sort of down at the bottom. So then we refit to those. And we just continue doing this until you know, our, our distribution sort of converges and we're not really making that many changes anymore. OK, so how does this improve upon local search? Well, we saw that with local search, we're, we're doing this 2 times n number of candidate points every single time. right? And we're only changing each one of those one parameters for each of those points. So the cross-entropy method is a little more efficient with how it goes about uh, sort of distributing the samples that we're looking at. Okay? In addition to that, we specify the number of samples. So we could still have you know, billions of parameters, but we're only going to be looking at m candidate points that we sample from that search distribution. Okay? So it sort of helps us scale the problem a little bit better. You still have to do a new set of rollouts for each of these points that you're evaluating, but we've sort of fixed the, the pr one of the problems with local search. Question? Do you do one rollout per point, or do you do average rollouts per point? Good question. The question was, do you do one rollout for each candidate point, or do you do m rollouts? So you do m rollouts. For every single point that you have, you're doing m, m policy rollouts. Yes. And that's a different m than the number of points that you're sampling. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Robert. Uh, yes. So we do have two m's here. Uh, the m that I wrote up here for the policy rollouts different from this m samples here. Okay. So sort of overloading the m there. Different m's. Yes. To like two, three, or like m elite. Yeah. Good question. So the the question was, how do you decide? how many points to take for your uh, M elite samples. Uh, that, that would really just be either your domain knowledge or sort of trial and error. Um, sort of, if you have a lot of parameters, right, you should probably take more elite samples to sort of get a better sense there. And also, like, if you're only taking one elite sample, right, that would not be so great because you would converge very, very quickly. So you sort of want to, you know, it's sort of that trade-off of taking too many and not taking enough. So it's sort of a trial and error there. OK, great. So just wrapping up, sort of summarizing what we saw with policy search, right? We started with the policy rollouts, and we saw that we use those policy rollouts 
to get us an estimate of the utility of a particular policy. With that estimate, we then use that in local search to do this sort of fixed step size in each parameter direction and then do those rollouts to evaluate the policy in each of those directions. And then what we just saw was cross entropy and that sort of changes on local search where now we're using this search distribution instead. Okay, so yes. You have like a bunch of rollouts for like a bunch of sample points. Doesn't that seem very computationally expensive? Yes, that is a great, great point. So the, the question was if we have uh, to do a new set of M rollouts for each one of these sample points, isn't that very computationally expensive? And the answer is in the general sense, yes, right? That's pretty inefficient to do all of those rollouts every single time we're looking at a new uh, candidate point. And so that's sort of where we're going now is how can we avoid having to do these new, uh, this new set of rollouts every time we want to make a change, okay? And so the, the whole focus now is sort of how can we get more efficient in these evaluations? Yes? When you say monte Carlo policy evaluation, when you sample the initial states used for rollouts, do you do the whole Monte Carlo business of like, oh, if we saw this a lot, we don't select it? If we saw this a lot, we don't select it. Last time we mentioned that we looked, like, with that, like, for instance, with Monte Carlo tree search, you would like keep track of how many point, like start states you ended up at, and you said we don't want to go to states that we ended up at too much. Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so this is different from Monte Carlo tree search. What we mean by the Monte Carlo estimates here is just where we sample from our distribution, and then we do this sort of. This is this is our Monte Carlo estimate here, where we've just we're approximating the integral over there. This expectation we're approximating that with the samples of the trajectories that we've taken. Yeah, good question. So different from Monte Carlo tree search. Yes. We're just using the specified depth. Yes, yeah. So we, we set the depth that we want to go to. So we could say we want to take, you know, 10 actions. So our depth would be 10. And we're going to do that rollout for 10 different actions. OK. In each of those 10 states we end up in, we'll multiply by the discount factor depending on how far along it is. Yes. And then yeah. set them all up. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, for that depth that we specify, uh, we're, we're looking at the discounted reward, essentially, along what we receive. OK, so we're going to sort of zoom out again to the big picture, right? We just looked at policy search. The main idea that we're working with, right, is that we have this parameterized policy, OK? So we have some set of parameters, and that's how we're sort of representing our policy. And we're looking at estimating the utility of that policy, OK? So with this sort of framework in mind and some of the maybe drawbacks that we've seen of policy search, where are we headed now? So what we're going to look at now is policy gradient estimation. Okay, so none of these methods that we just saw with local search, that none of those use the gradient information of our policy. Okay, and so we can sort of get more information out of how to improve our policy if we do look at the gradient of our policy. But why would we want to estimate the gradient? Well, the reason is that we want to use that for optimization. Okay, so we have our policy pi of theta. We, ha we know we can estimate the utility of that policy. Now we want to look at how can we use gradient information of this parameterized policy to improve our policy. So when we're talking about gradients, I think the most natural place that we would start is with looking at a finite difference method. Okay, And so that's where we're going to start with gradient estimation here. So for finite difference, what we're going to start with is just looking at the definition of the gradient, right? So what we want to get to here is an expression for the gradient with respect to theta of u of theta. Okay, so just from the definition of the gradient, this will be the partial derivative of u with respect to theta 1. And then that will be, we'll just do that n for each of our n parameters, right? So then with respect to theta n. OK, so that's just definition of the gradient that we're working with. What the finite difference method does is basically just let's approximate this gradient. OK, so what we're going to do here is say that this is approximately equal to u of theta plus delta times this basis vector 
We'll talk about what this basis vector is. Minus u of theta over delta. Okay, so we do that for our first parameter. And remember, just from the definition of a derivative, right? With a, with a derivative, we're just looking at the limit of this expression as delta goes to zero. So with our finite difference, we're just saying, OK, we'll take a small enough delta and sort of call this good enough. OK, that's, a, that's our finite difference approximation. So we then repeat this for each of our parameters. So this will then be u of theta plus delta, the nth basis vector, minus u of theta over delta. OK, so what's, what's that basis vector? Well, so E1, it's very simple. It's just telling us which indice of this vector is not 0. So E1 will just look like this, where we have 1 in the first index and then zeros all the way down. OK, and then similarly, En, the nth basis vector, is just zeros, and then the last component is 1. So that's all the basis vector is, OK? And so what we're doing here is we're just looking at our theta vector, right? We have our theta 1 to theta n. And all I'm saying in that first one is let me add some small delta to my theta, my first component here, only the first component. Let me add some small delta. Let me evaluate the utility there and look at the difference, OK? And that's all we're doing to estimate that, that partial derivative of the first term. We then do that for each of our n parameters, OK? And so for, for each one of these, notice that what we have to do to compute this, right, we have to do a new set of m policy rollouts, OK? So first, we have to do a set of m policy rollouts to estimate this utility. Then when we change just that theta 1, we have to do a new set of m rollouts. And then for every single one of these, we have to do another new set of m rollouts, OK? So again, that's a lot of, of rollouts that we're having to do. So that's one of the drawbacks. The other is that sort of like local search, right, we're, we're only changing one of these thetas each time we're doing this. Okay, So not super robust in that estimate that we're going to be getting. So an extension of the finite difference method is just looking at basically the same thing, but how can we do this a little bit more smartly? So the way we're going to do that is just with linear regression. Okay, So this is called the regression gradient, but what it comes down to is just doing linear regression uh, to estimate this gradient. So we're going to introduce this delta theta matrix here. And what this delta theta is, is basically we're just going to have this uh, delta theta 1 here. And we're going to transpose that. And we're going to break this down here. But we're going to do this delta theta. So this perturbation here is what you can think about that as. We're going to do that m different times. So there's a lot of m's here. So <laughs> don't get confused with the m's. Um, so we have m different perturbations here. So looking again at our, at our theta vector, one of these delta thetas, so this first delta theta, what we do is we go and we just randomly perturb each component of our theta vector. So for theta 1, we add some random perturbation. Theta 2, add some random perturbation. We do that all the way down to our theta n, just adding random perturbation to each one of those. We then take that delta theta, which is just a random perturbation, and we just lay it flat in this matrix here. Okay, So we have n components that we've just laid flat. We're doing that random perturbation m different times. Okay, So the dimensions of this delta theta or m by n. Okay? So just random perturbation that we've laid flat, and we're doing that random perturbation m different times. Yes, question? Is there a random from like the last like change value of the theta? Yes, yes. So the, uh, the delta theta here, we, so we start with, so the question was is the random perturbation from the last, uh, like the initial theta that you were starting with? And yes, that's correct. So we have some initial theta. We then look at perturbing that, so just adding some random perturbation to that, and then that becomes our, our delta theta here. Okay. So similarly, we can write out the delta u now using this delta theta. And that is just very similar to what we have with the finite difference. 
That's just u of theta, so our, whatever initial theta we were working with, plus delta theta 1 minus u of theta. And then we're going to do that again m different times now because we have m delta thetas here. So this will be u of theta plus delta theta m minus u of theta. Okay, so that becomes our delta u. And now what you can sort of think about, like in the scalar case, right, if we want to look at the slope of a line, right, what we would say for the, for the scalar case is, well, that's just delta, uh, delta u over delta theta, right, just sort of the rise over run relationship. Okay, that's not what we're doing here because these are vectors here, so this doesn't make any sense. But just sort of mapping that back to give you that intuition of, in the scalar case, if we wanted to approximate this slope of a line, we would just do delta u over delta theta. So we're going to do a very similar thing along that similar idea, just using linear regression, right? Because we have our delta u, we have our delta theta, what we want is our gradient with respect to u of theta, okay? So we're just going to now, this is just a linear regression problem that we can set up here. So the solution to this is just going to be the gradient with respect to theta, well, that's approximately equal to delta theta, the pseudo inverse of delta theta, so we're going to talk about this, and then times our delta u. Okay, so we just want to check the dimensions here to make sure this makes sense, right? So our delta u, well, that just has m components, right? So this is m by 1. Delta theta was m by n, but we took the pseudo inverse of it, so that gives us n by m now. And so when we multiply those two together, we're left with n by 1, and we know that's what our gradient should be. Okay, so what is this pseudo inverse of delta theta? Well, the pseudo inverse just gives us the least squares estimate here for our linear regression problem. Okay, so the pseudo inverse is just the general form of an inverse when our matrix delta theta here might not necessarily be invertible. So if we actually wanted to go and write out the expression for delta theta pseudo inverse, that would involve taking the singular value decomposition but in Python or Julia, there's just a built-in p inv, so it's just like this, p inv function that you can call, and that will give you the pseudo inverse. So it will do that singular value decomposition for you. Okay, so it's just the general form of getting this uh, least squares estimate here between our delta thetas and delta u's. Okay, so how, how does this help us? How is this better than what we saw with the finite difference method? Well, for one, and I'd say the main thing, is that now you're looking at this delta theta, so you're looking at this perturbation among all of your n parameters, not just one of them at a time. Okay? And then you're repeating that m different times, and each time you're repeating that, you're doing a new set of rollouts here. So we still have that problem where you have to do a new set of rollouts for each of these, but this gives us a, a little smoother estimate, right? It's a little more robust because we're looking at sort of the net effect of all of these small changes in our theta vector. Question. Sorry, question. Can you motivate um, taking a limb rank again, starting from the fact that we have delta u? Like how does that, like, how does the limb rank end up at the gradient estimate? Good, Good question. question. So the question was, how do we sort of get here uh, using this linear regression idea? So I think one way to think about it is that before, before getting to here, right, we would have this idea of delta u would be equal to, uh, should be delta theta times this gradient estimate, right? And maybe the best way to think about this, at least how I like to think about it, is if you think about just like looking at the slope of a line here, right? So where this would be our, our u and this would be our theta. So when we're looking at the slope of this, right, we're just saying, can everyone see this or is the podium blocking it? Everyone? Okay, all right. So when we're looking at the slope here, we can just say, well, this is delta u, right? This is delta theta. So we're looking at sort of that, and that's what I was saying before is like delta, delta u over delta theta is what we're interested in. So when we get this here, this is sort of like, right? It's not at all exact because we're working with vectors and matrices here. So this is like delta u over delta theta with this inverse. 
Not equivalent at all, but just sort of that's the, that's the idea to have in mind. Yes? Why is delta theta not invertible? Good question. So the question was, why is delta theta not invertible in the general case? Well, for one, if you have m different from n, then you could have sort of a, like what we call a short matrix, right? And so that wouldn't, that wouldn't be an invertible because it's not square to begin with. But you could also have issues with like the rank of the delta theta matrix. Since you're doing these random perturbations, it's not necessarily guaranteed to be invertible. Yes? This matrix here? Yeah. Yes. So the question was, what is n? What is m? n here is the number of parameters that we have in our theta, uh, theta vector. And then m is just the number of these random per perturbations that we're doing. And the, but then we also, like I mentioned, we have m rollouts that we're doing as well. But those are different m's. So we're, we're using a lot of m's here. Yep. Yes. And just to be clear, all of the perturbations are just completely random for each of those, like, n rows? Yep. Yeah. So the, the question was, are all of these perturbations just random? Yeah. So you could use, like, some how you, like, what type of random noise you use, that's sort of up to you. But yeah, it's just, if we use, like, a, just some Gaussian noise, we could just add that Gaussian noise to each uh, component. OK, so that's the regression gradient. Now, with that, we still have the issue that we have to do this new set of rollouts for each of these, right? And I think you asked about that earlier. Like, isn't this still a lot of, of new rollouts to compute? And the answer is yes, that, that is still an issue. So where we're sort of going now is we want to look at just an analytical expression for this gradient. So if you recall from before, we had this expression for u of theta, where we had it as the, this expectation, which we could write as the probability of that trajectory occurring times the reward we receive along that trajectory. OK, so that's sort of where we're going to start from, right? This is just what we saw before with this expectation over trajectories. So we're going to start from here. And our goal is to get some analytical expression of this gradient. OK, so no more finite difference approximation here. We want to work this out. So we're just going to take the gradient now. We're going to say gradient with respect to u of theta. And so we can just look at this integral now. Our integral is with respect to tau. So we can bring this uh, gradient with respect to theta inside the integral. And we just get this expression. OK, so nothing too crazy yet, right? And now what we're going to do is just multiply by 1. OK, we're just going to simply multiply by 1. So we have this p pi of tau over p pi of tau. And then we still have this expression here. So still gradient with respect to theta, p pi of tau, r of tau. So you might be saying, why would we do that? Why did we just multiply by 1? Right? That, doesn't, that doesn't look too nice of an expression to work with. But what we can notice is that we, this allows us to sort of rewrite some things in terms of log probabilities. So. The fact that we can sort of notice is if we look at the gradient with respect to theta of log p pi of tau, right? If we take the gradient of log of theta, right, that would give us 1 over theta, right? So just the derivative of log of x is 1 over x. So if we take the gradient with respect to this and we use the chain rule, this would give us 1 over p pi of tau. And then chain rule says, take the gradient of the outside term times gradient of the inside term, right? So the gradient of the inside term is just gradient with respect to theta p pi of tau. OK, so this was just the chain rule to get this simplification here. OK, all we did was take the chain rule of this, this term here. But now notice, this gradient with respect to theta p pi of tau shows up 
in this expression. That's why we multiplied by 1. So now we can substitute this back in. Okay, we can substitute this expression in here, and we'll, have the we'll bring the log inside. Okay, so this expression up here becomes p pi of tau, gradient with respect to theta, log p pi of tau, r of tau, d tau. Now you might be saying, well, this doesn't look a whole lot better than what we started with. In fact, this, this kind of looks worse, right? But um, I assure you, we are, we are getting somewhere here, OK? So what we can notice here is that this is just an expectation now. We've just sort of rewritten the expectation that we started with in a different form, now using the log probability, OK? So it'll come together, I promise you. So we can rewrite this now as the expectation over trajectories of the gradient with respect to theta, log p pi of tau, r of tau. OK. So that's where we're at now. We're getting somewhere. But now we're sort of focused on this term, right? We want to simplify this a little bit. Because we need to know, right, what is this p pi of tau? What's the probability of a trajectory occurring when following policy pi? Okay, so that's what, that's what we're going to talk about now, is how do, we, how do we get that probability? So I might, I'm, I'm going to come over here just so you can finish writing that down if you are. So probability of a trajectory, right? Remember that a trajectory is just a sequence of states and actions. So we have state one, we took action A1, and then we can just continue this out, right, all the way up to the depth. So state D, action D. Okay, so that's just our trajectory, sequence of states and actions. What we're asking now is, what is the probability of this trajectory occurring? Okay, and I think a good way to think about that is back to sort of the, the picture we had with the Markov decision process, right? Where we had some state. From that state, we took some action. That action gave us some reward here. And then we transitioned to a new state. So when we're talking about the probability of this trajectory occurring, what does that look like? Well, we have to start somewhere, right? What's the probability that we start in that initial state? Okay, And that's back to the B of S term, where like, what, that's saying, what's this probability of this state occurring? Okay, What's the probability that we are starting in this state? So that's, where, that's our sort of starting point for this probability expression, right? Just what's the probability that we start in that state? Now that we're in state 1, so we're in state 1, we take action A1, what's the probability that we transition to state 2? Okay, so that's just our transition probability, right? Probability that we transition to state 2 given we were in state 1 and took action A1. But we're not done there. There's one more term. And this specific term is when we're working with stochastic policies. Okay? So a stochastic policy is different from a deterministic policy. Okay? So we write our stochastic policy like this. So that's our stochastic policy, where this is a distribution over actions given our current state. That's different from a deterministic policy, which we would write just like this. Okay? That would just tell us we're in some state, we're going to take an action. Our stochastic policy is a distribution now. We're in some state, I now have a distribution of actions that I could take. So I'm not always going to take the same action in the same state. Okay? So that's, that's what we're, we're saying when we're talking about stochastic policies. The reason we're working with stochastic policies in this likelihood ratio policy gradient method will become clearer but for now, just, just focus on the fact this is a distribution over actions, OK? Which means that we're not just done with this transition term, because we also have the probability that we took that action. So the probability we took action A1 in state 1, OK? So we can continue this out now all the way for our entire trajectory. But we can just write it a little simpler with some product notation here where we have p of s1 
then this becomes a product now, we'll say from k equals 1 to d, of the probability that we transition to state k plus 1, given we were in state k and took action ak, then times the probability that we took action k in state sk. OK, so that's the expression for this probability term that we had over here. Any questions on how we got that probability or, or why we're doing this? Yes? The legibility, what's the letter on top of the product? Ah, yes, the question was, what's this letter? That is D. So that's the depth of our trajectory. Yep. OK, so from here, it's, it's all downhill from here, all right? We're just, now we just, we have this expression. We just need to take the log of it and then take the gradient. Okay, so those are the next two steps we're going to do. So there's a light at the end of the tunnel here. So first, we're just going to take the log of this. We know the nice part about logs is this is just one giant product here. So when we take the log of a product, it just becomes the sum of logs, right? So that's all we're going to do. We're going to take the log of this. And when we take the log of this, it becomes log P of S1. This product here becomes a sum. So we get the sum from k equals 1 to d of log of this term. So log p sk plus 1, given we were in sk, took action ak. And then the last term here is this uh, pi theta. So then plus log pi theta ak given sk. OK. so. One out of two steps done now. The last thing we have to do is just take the gradient of that expression. So you might be like, oh no, we have to take the gradient now. But it's very nice here in this case because what happens when we take the gradient with respect to theta of this term? It just drops out, right? It doesn't depend on theta. So that goes away. Does this term depend on theta? No. So we can also just get rid of that term. And that's a huge result when working with stochastic policies. Okay, that's why I made this differentiation here about we're working with stochastic policies. Because when we're looking at this likelihood ratio policy gradient, it does not depend on the transition model when we take the gradient of the log probability. This transition model drops out. And that's a huge result, which we'll see sort of a real world example of that in a second. But that's something you wanna keep in mind is when I look at the gradient of this log probability, this transition model does not show up, okay? And that's, that's a really nice result for us. So all we're left now is the gradient with respect to theta of this term, okay? So we'll rewrite this over here. Okay, so the expression that we come to at the end is going to be this expectation over trajectories, the sum from k equals 1 to our depth times the gradient with respect to theta, log pi theta, ak given sk times the reward along the trajectory. OK, so that's, that's the sort of end result of the likelihood ratio policy gradient. Now, you might be saying, well, but we didn't take the gradient of this yet. Like, what is, what is this here? Well, remember, for our particular policy that we've parameterized, right, we can typically take the gradient with respect to that. So if, if pi theta is a neural network, right, we can evaluate the gradient of that neural network through backpropagation. If pi theta is some other function that we've set up, we typically can, we know the gradient of that function with respect to our parameters. So this is good news for us that this is the only term that's showing up in this gradient. Because very often in practice, when we've set up our own parameterized policy, we can take the gradient of that policy. Okay, so this is a, a nice spot to be in for us. Any questions on how we, how we got to here, this point? Yes. Sorry, backtracking a little bit. You had the previous expression at one point where you substituted in the log of like the gradient of the log. How did you end up with that expression? So not that one, even before below that line. Yeah. So 
on, on the very top of this board. This board. Is how did you end up with that expression? Ah, yes, OK. So the question is, how did we get this expression? So this expression, typically called like the log derivative trick, I don't really like that name because it's just, it's just the chain rule. You're just taking the gradient of the log probability. So you can think about if I had, if, like instead of thinking about this, if I just had log of x, right? The derivative of log of x is just 1 over x, right? So when I'm taking the gradient with respect to theta of this term, I'm just taking the gradient of the outside, which is 1 over p of tau, and then times the gradient of the inside. Yeah, so just chain rule there. And they call it the log derivative trick, but I don't know. It's not a trick to me. It's just you're taking the gradients, right? OK, so I mentioned that it's a nice sort of result that we don't have the transition model here, that the transition model doesn't show up. And so this is just sort of a, an example to get you thinking about if I wanted to, if I had this robotic arm and I wanted to use either the likelihood ratio policy gradient or one of the extensions that we'll talk about to train a policy to sort of manipulate and pick up all of these, this diverse set of objects. If I had to do that and I needed to know the transition model, right, that's going to be pretty tedious because I have to think about, okay, if I'm picking up a lemon and I move my manipulator in this direction, what's that going to do to the lemon? Now, if I came from the other direction instead, how's that going to change the lemon, right? So I have to think about all of these different cases and then I also have to do that, well, what if I'm picking up an apple instead, right? So knowing that transition probability can be pretty tedious. Not impossible, right? There's simulators out there that do this and that's available, but it just sort of makes our lives easier, right? If we don't have to think about what is this transition probability because it just dropped out of our gradient expression, okay? So that's just one of the reasons that that's such a nice result. And that, that example on the right actually from OpenAI was trained using proximal policy optimization. So time permitting, we'll hopefully get to that by the end of the lecture, just to sort of give you a sense of, of where we're going. OK. So now, sort of where we're at here with the likelihood ratio policy gradient, we, we have this estimate, and it's an unbiased estimate, but it has pretty high variance. OK. So what do we mean when we're talking about bias and variance here? So this, this image that we have is showing here for the high bias case, okay? So the red is the true value. The black is the, our mean estimate, okay? So when we have high bias, our mean is deviating from the true value. When we have high variance, you can see that there's this large spread in the possible values uh, that we could have. Okay, so what, where we sort of want to be is over here, where we have low bias and low variance. Where we're sitting at right now with our likelihood ratio policy gradient is here. We have low bias, but we have high variance. So now what we're going to focus on is how can we reduce the variance of this estimate? And I think that goes back to your question earlier about don't these rollout methods give us very high variance? And the answer is yes, especially for when we're working with the likelihood ratio policy gradient. So how can we now reduce that variance? That's what we're going to talk about now. And one other thing just to keep in mind is that the variance of this estimate generally increases with rollout depth. Okay, So looking at this trajectory here, as our depth gets further and further into the future, the variance of our estimate increases. So why might that be the case? Well, you can think about, right, as as you go further into the future, it gets harder and harder to attribute this reward that I received like somewhere in the middle. Was that because one of the early actions I took or was it from something I did you know, in the middle? Which, which action attributed to that, right? So like a, a similar example, if you get a promotion, right? What specific action led to that promotion occurring? Was it what you ate for breakfast that morning? Or was it you know, 20 years before when you went to some event at your college and you met somebody who then ended up working at that company that then got you a job there, right? Which, which specific action was it that led to that promotion, okay? So that's sort of what we're talking about here is it, it gets harder to sort of map that causality in these actions as our trajectory depth gets longer. And so that's what we're looking at sort of reducing now. And the reward to go is one way that we can go about doing this. Okay, so reward to go, we're going to start from 
from this expression that we have. So we're starting from the result of the likelihood ratio policy gradient. And I think the best way to sort of think about what the reward to go is trying to do is by looking at a, a timeline here. So we have at the start, right, we take some action, our first action, we get some reward here. We then take a new action, we get some new reward. We repeat this, right, so now we're at action K, we get some reward K. And then after that we get we take action k plus 1, we get reward k plus 1. But what you might see here is when we're looking at this sum over our trajectory and looking at action k specifically, that action has no influence over the rewards that occurred in the past. Right? That we, we cannot, this action here cannot change any of those rewards we got in the past. It can only change what we do now or in the future. So if we have an agent here, that agent, when it's looking at what action to take, it should not care about any good things it did in the past, any mistakes that it made, right? It should forget about that and only focus on the future, okay? I didn't intend to get so deep there, but there's some, there's some philosophy here in this reward to go. <laughs> so, okay, so if we have action AK, we're basically saying we don't want, or we have no influence over what any of these rewards are. Right? We, can't, we can't change what those rewards are. Only now or in the future. Okay? And so that's what the reward to go is trying to correct for, is this causality of actions and rewards. So how we're going to go about this is we just look at this R of tau, right, is just the discounted reward that we receive along that trajectory. So R of tau is just the sum from k equals 1 to d of R of k gamma to the k minus 1. Okay, so it's just the discounted reward that we're getting along these trajectories. What we're doing with the reward to go approach is we're just going to split up this sum. Okay, we're just going to split up the sum and then we're going to simplify it a little bit. Okay, so just writing out the same expression that we have but then we're going to substitute in the sum. So this is the, just the expectation. Sum k equals 1 to d gradient with respect to theta. This is the log here. OK, so now instead of r of tau, we're just going to bring that sum in. But instead of just writing it how we've written it up there, we're going to split it up into two separate sums. Yes? When you say R of K over there, it, that is distinct from gamma of K minus 1. It says R of K is R of function of K, like R at time K. Yes, <laughs> yes, good point. So the question was, when we write R of K with these parentheses, that's not an exponent. That's like sort of the index to our R of K, whereas gamma to the K minus 1 is an is a exponent. Good question. OK, so we're just going to split up that sum here. So how we're going to split it up is just by introducing this new index that we're going to call L. So we're just going to go from L. This L is different from our k index here. Okay, So we're going from L equals 1 to k minus 1. And that's going to be R of L gamma to the L minus 1. So we've done that. And then we're just, we're just splitting up that sum here. So now we're going to have plus L equals k to to d here. Okay, and that's going to be r of l gamma to the l minus 1. Okay, so all we've done, we just took r of tau, we wrote out the expression for r of tau as that summation, and then we just split up that summation from k equals 1 to d. Now we're just going l equals 1 to k minus 1 and l equals k to d. Okay, that's all we've done. Why would we do this? Well, remember our timeline of events here. At action k, we're saying we want our agent to forget about the past, right? Don't worry about what happened in the past, only focus on the future. So if we want our agent to move on and forget about the past, we're just going to drop the past and focus on the future, okay? So all of those terms there are terms, reward terms that occurred in the past. We're now only focused on the re reward terms that occur now or in the future, okay? And so we can just rewrite this slightly as 
If we factor out a gamma to the k minus 1, this is just sort of convention of how it's typically written. This becomes still L equals k to d, r of L. Now it's just gamma to the L minus k. And what this term here is called is the reward to go. So we call this the reward to go. All it is is just sort of correcting for that reward action causality. Okay, so now if we rewrite this whole expression using this reward to go, what we're left with is just this. So we still have this sum on the outside. And now it's just gamma to the k minus 1 times r of k to go. Okay, so all we did here was sort of just remove those terms that occurred in the past so that when we're looking at action k, that's only being sort of weighted here in this uh, expectation. It's only being weighted by the rewards that occur now or in the future. Okay, that's the reward to go approach. And the nice part about this is that it leads to a decrease in variance. Okay, why does it lead to a decrease in variance? Well, we've sort of made the signal a little bit clearer now. We've made that causality a little bit clearer. Instead of just having this large reward term that's multiplying every single action that we're looking at, we're only weighting it now by the rewards that that action can influence. Okay, any questions on reward to go? Yes. Hey, clarification again. Um, can you clarify uh, what the notation switch was? Some like there to the line below. Yes. Okay. So the the question was, what's the notation switch we did from here to here? So at this step, we just split up the the sum up there. So we just went from l equals one to k minus one, and then k to d. So just going, it's the same thing from one to d, but we just split it up. Then going here, so. Let me draw this sort of to distinguish them. Uh, all we did here was we just factored out a gamma to the k minus 1 from this term. Okay, so we just brought gamma to the k minus 1 out in front. And what that left us with was just gamma to the l minus k instead of l minus 1. So if you just multiply gamma to the k minus 1 back inside, it'll bring us back to here. And the reason we did that is just sort of for convention, the reward to go is written typically like this. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Why are both gammas what? Raised to L minus one. Why are both gammas raised to L minus one? Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. So why are the gammas here raised to L minus one? Well, it comes back from this expression, right, which is just the discounted reward into the future. So you can think about when along this timeline, right, at time step one, we get the immediate reward. But then at time step two, we have a discount, so we multiply that by gamma because we're discounting the future rewards. So then gamma k will then have a factor gamma k minus 1. And we'll just continue that out. Yes? Before we apply the reward to gamma, does the reward term go inside the summation? Does the reward, oh, this term here. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, well, so it's, it's weighting each of those actions in the sum there. So each of those actions, we're multiplying by the like when we're doing this sum k equals 1 to d. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. Did you also? I think the clarification is you're using L in both of those cases. So it's different L in the context of each of those sums. Oh, yes, yeah. Between, yeah. between this one and, yeah. Just those two here. Right, yeah. So the, the L's here are different from. Uh, well, different like, from each other. Yeah, from each other, yeah. This L is only for this sum. This L is only for this sum. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so one other thing we can do now to decrease this variance is what's called baseline subtraction. And baseline subtraction, we're just starting from the reward to go expression, and now we're just subtracting some baseline off of that. OK, so uh, sort of the, the reason why we're doing this is if you think about like this example where you're in some state and you have three possible actions available to you, and each of those actions give you plus 1,000 reward. 
When you first see this, you might be like, awesome, this is a great state to be in, right? Like, no matter what I do, I'm getting plus a thousand reward. That's, that's great. But when we're talking about estimating the gradient and using that gradient information to sort of change our policy parameters, this plus a thousand in each of these different actions is not really giving us a whole lot of information to work with on how we should change our policy, right? Maybe, maybe like in a, in a global sense, right, it would give us some way to say, well, we want to get to this state. But just looking at this state in specifically, right, the plus a thousand for each action, every action in that state is the same to us. So what the reward to go, what the, what the baseline subtraction method is saying is instead of looking at the net reward that you receive, let's look at the reward relative to some baseline. Okay, so in this case, we could choose the baseline that we want to use as the average reward from the actions that we get. Okay, so in that case, when we look at the, the baseline reward, that would be a thousand, right? Because each action is giving us a thousand. So now when we look at this reward from this action relative to that baseline, it'll be zero, right? Because it's just average. It's just an average action. Similar for this one and this one. Now, if instead we had like plus a million here, then when looking at this reward relative to the average, so relative to our baseline, that's going to say, well, hey, this is a pretty good action, right? It's way better than the average action that we had. So let's sort of shift our policy parameters to get us to take that action. Okay, so that's the whole idea of baseline subtraction. Don't look at just the net reward. Look at the reward relative to some baseline. Okay, what baseline you choose, that's up to you. There's many different baselines out there, so you could use average reward. There's a proof that you can get sort of the minimum variance baseline. Um, but really, the, the main idea is just using a baseline sort of also helps you to bring out the signal. Bring out the signal in that policy rollout of what, what actions are actually more beneficial relative to some baseline. Okay, so that's, that's baseline subtraction. Just another method that we can use to decrease the variance of that estimate. Yes? Is the baseline different for every node, or do you present it properly? Uh, so the question was, is your baseline different for every uh, specific action you're looking at, or do you set it globally? And the answer would be, it depends. So you could have a baseline that depends, that is action dependent, right? That gets a little complicated. So in the general case, you can just set a global baseline, right? You could just set the baseline to be the mean reward you received across all actions. So that's one option, but it's sort of up to you in, in how you set that baseline. Okay, so just to sort of recap what we've seen, we started with finite difference and saw that we can estimate the gradient using that finite difference. We then saw we could get a little more robust estimate using linear regression. And then we looked at the likelihood ratio, which gave us basically an analytical expression for doing this. Uh, but it was a pretty high variance estimate. So then we were looking at how can we reduce the variance of that estimate. Okay, so that's, that is our policy gradient estimation. Okay, so now we have some estimate of the policy gradient. And you might be thinking like, okay, wow, that felt like a lot of math, like that likelihood ratio derivation was kind of long. Like, why, why did we do all of this work? What was it for? Um, and so now we're going to put our work to use for us with policy gradient optimization. Okay, so the whole reason we were looking at those gradient estimates were so that we could optimize our policy. Okay, we wanted to use the gradient information to sort of guide our, our policy improvement. So that's what we're gonna be talking about now. So what we're gonna start with is just basic gradient ascent, okay? So when we're doing gradient ascent, we're trying to sort of maximize the utility Okay, and, and how we're going to do that is just by taking these sort of iterative steps. So what we're showing on the left here is the true function that we're working with. On the right is sort of the, uh, the, the contour plot of that function. Okay, so the initial point that we're starting at is this white point here. So that's our initial parameters. And then we're just going to look at what's, what's the direction of the gradient there. And then we're going to step in that direction. Okay, so all we're doing is we're updating our parameters theta by some fixed so step size alpha, so alpha is our step size in this case, times the gradient of our function, okay? And so we can just do this over and over and over, and based on that fixed step size that we've set, hopefully, eventually, we'll converge to the maximum. 
Step factor, yes. Thank you. Alpha the step factor. So this is a relatively nice function, right? It's very smooth, pretty easy to work with and follow the gradient to the maximum. A lot of the time, the functions that we're working with are not that nice, okay? So we can't sort of just close the book right now and say, awesome, let's just use gradient ascent. Let's fix our alpha as some, some constant and go from there because the devil is really in the details of how we choose that alpha, okay? <laughs> so, so to see an example of this, right? If we set alpha to be too large, what's gonna happen? So if we have just some large constant alpha, we're gonna start at this initial theta, we're gonna look at the gradient, and then we're gonna step in the direction of the gradient based on our large alpha. And that will send us way over to the left side here. Okay, and now for this visual example, like all of the gradient that's, that I've drawn are not like actually correct. So don't be like, wait, with an alpha there, it wouldn't actually go that far, okay? Just for visualization here. Um, so then we'd repeat this process now. We'd look at the gradient at this point, and that would send us shooting way over here. So now we're over here, and we're gonna repeat, and now we've jumped way over there. So you can see when we have too large of an alpha, we don't really converge. We're just sort of bouncing around, right? And on the other side, when our alpha is too small, what would happen? Well, we'd look at our gradient, we'd step, and then it would just not really move, right? And we'd do it again and again, and we're just gonna sl very slowly converge, okay? So we're gonna waste a lot of computation there. So our goal here is that we want to be able to optimize some approximation of this U of theta objective with these constraints that our new thetas, our theta primes, are not too far from our initial starting theta. Okay, that's our, that's our overall goal here. So how we do that is we introduce this constraint function, and we're gonna call this constraint function g. So g is sort of like a similarity measure or distance measure, not exactly right, but it's just some way that we sort of are measuring the distance here between our new theta primes against our old thetas. And we want that to be less than or equal to some epsilon that we're setting as this free parameter. So the methods that we're gonna talk about in the next three minutes um, <laughs> are, <laughs> are these four methods that we're uh, not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we're gonna start with a uh, restricted gradient here. And so the methods, the main idea that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this is the main two ways that these approaches differ are one, how they're forming the objective that we're trying to optimize, and two, how they're structuring that constraint, okay? Other than that, they're pretty much the same, but they're just taking different flavors on how we set the objective, how we set the constraints. So starting with restricted gradient, which I'd say is sort of the simplest of these approaches, we're starting with, remember we have those two knobs, objective and constraint, so we're looking at now restricted gradient, how it sets this objective. The restricted gradient method just does a very simple first order approximation. So we're just saying, okay, our true function looks like that. Our current theta is here. Let's look at the gradient. And that blue line becomes our approximation of the function that we're trying to optimize. Okay, so we don't actually know the true U of theta, right? But we're just saying, this is a pretty, pretty good estimate for us. As long as we stay close to that initial theta point, the first order approximation hopefully is okay. So when we move to theta prime now, and we evaluate a new point, what this surrogate objective is telling us is that our new u of theta prime will be approximately equal to just this first order Taylor expansion that we've done. Okay, so this is just the first order approximation of the true u of theta that we're looking at. And that's how the restricted gradient method goes about that. So using this first order approximation now, what our optimization problem looks like we now, we, we have this u theta prime and our constraint function, remember that's our other knob that we're introducing here, is just this expression here. So all we're doing is we're looking at theta prime minus theta, the transpose of that, this is the identity matrix here, and then theta prime minus theta. Okay, so that's just the two norm, right? So if we're working in like a two dimensional space, right? That's just like the Euclidean distance between our theta and our theta prime. So we're just saying keep that distance less than or equal to some epsilon. So don't move theta too far. That's all we're saying here. That's what that expression written out is saying. So very quickly, wrapping this up, uh, we can 
basically, so, so we can make some simplifications here, but essentially what we're left with is that restricted gradient is trying to maximize this expression subject to keeping our uh, constraints, our theta prime and our theta within some epsilon distance, okay? All of the other methods that we didn't get to, they're basically just different variations of this where they're changing the objective or changing the constraint function, okay? So zooming back out again now to the big picture to wrap up, all, all we've done today is we, we've looked at policy optimization, right? So we started with policy search where we had some parameterized policy and we made these local changes to it without looking at any gradient information. Then we switched and we started looking at, okay, how can I estimate the gradient of this policy? And then we sort of concluded with looking at how can I then use that gradient estimate to optimize my policy subject to these constraints that I don't move too far, okay? So that is policy optimization in a nutshell. I hope that was helpful to you. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, and we'll wrap up here. Thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions.